Well, thanks, uh, Vincent, for the warm welcome and generous introduction, and Ken as well. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. And it's fun to present uh, some of this work here. So this is a project that I've been working on. Um, I suppose the generous interpretation uh, for me would be, you know, maybe two years or something. The ungenerous one would maybe 10. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm sort of returning to my early, my earliest um, case, the, you know, where I did my initial field work um, during, during graduate school, actually, and taking it in a bit of a different direction, doing some different things than I did previously, but it stems from that. And um, as you can probably tell from Vincent's introduction, it is tied to my interest in my work in, um, in the rural sector in a lot of countries in the world, and in particular in, uh, in Latin America. So it, it, in that way, it sort of interfaces a little bit with my, um, my first my first book and the second book. I was talking with Jeremy. These Cambridge Elements things are kind of cheats for books. They're not really a book, but in any case. Um, okay, so the, the question in this particular project is what is the relationship between land reform and civil conflict intensity? And uh, in particular, I'm gonna focus on the Peruvian case and ask the question, how did Peru's land reform affect violence under Sendero Luminoso, also known as Shining Path, between 1980 and 2000, which is when the insurgency in Peru sort of raged. <clears throat> the relationship between, I mean, the relationship between land reform and civil conflict has been examined, I would say, in a, in a number of contexts. Um, but this gives you some sense of, uh, you know, how these two phenomena sort of intersect or, you know, and potentially relate to one another. So there are about, I think, um, 35 or so countries that have had um, land reform and civil war occurring coterminously or have had civil wars just on the back of um, significant land reform programs, right? So there's reason to believe, at least from a temp temp in a temporal sense, right, that these two phenomena might be, might be related. The existing literature on this, um, you know, there's not quite as much recent literature on this, but there was a long-standing literature um, on land reform and conflict, starting probably in the in the 60s. Um, and most authors argued that land reform should diminish guerrilla support or uh, insurgent strength for several different reasons. One is that you know, land reform restructures land tenure patterns, grants land to the landless, um, and that that helps to uh, undermine peasant support for rebels, right? And for anti-system sort of groups. Um, secondly, it can ameliorate, land reform can ameliorate grievances over prevailing land holding inequality, where land holding inequality is particularly high, as it has been historically in, um, you know, in most countries in the world. And finally, it can increase the opportunity costs of joining or supporting armed groups, right? Um, because you, you know, if you receive land, um, you produce on that land, you're earning more, it becomes relatively more costly to potentially give that up and join a, a rebel group. The evidence, however, is more mixed about the relationship between land reform and civil conflict. So there are a couple of reasons why that might be true. So land reform may fail to undermine uh, conflict, because there might be, uh, for example, disparate policies that undercut its effectiveness. So, um, you know, repression by, by the state, for example, could potentially backfire in the context of a land reform program. Um, also, you know, the nature of land reform implementation or the structure of land reform implementation can also potentially lead, um, lead land reform to sort of backfire and generate more contestation uh, and potentially even more conflict. So I found that that's true in a couple of cases in, uh, in Colombia, in, during Colombia's civil war and in the context of uh, land squatting, large scale land squatting in Brazil. And a couple of other authors have found that landlord uh, actions that sort of blunt or distort the intended effects of land reform programs can then um, sort of backfire and generate more contestation. And this is a, a project on uh, Russia around the time of the emancipation of the serfs. And this is one about uh, Iran from the 1960s. So there's a couple of new contributions to this part from this um, particular project. So the first is a theoretical one. So most land reforms that have occurred in the world, um, you know, what might be called classic land reforms are these top-down redistributive land reforms uh, in the sense that governments often set 
things like land holding ceilings um, or production criteria. And then if you don't meet those land holding ceilings or production criteria, your land is expropriated and then it's redistributed to others. That characterizes about 85% of all major land reforms that have occurred since 1900. Yet, um, you know, no scholars have basically examined the, uh, empirically examined the effects of these land reform programs on conflict. They have looked at other types of land reforms that fall in the other 15%. Um, and the second is uh, an empirical contribution. So I'm going to examine local level patterns of land distribution alongside event level conflict data. So it's very, there's a, a high degree of granularity. And that enables comparing like types of, of land reform and conflict across different units of analysis. So we're gonna go subnational here. Um, and that, that's helpful for a, a variety of reasons. Okay, so to give you a little bit of background um, for, from the Peruvian case, right? So a lot of authors in, uh, who have studied Peru, um, you know, sort of for a long time thought that Peru seems to be this sort of exceptional case, right? So here's a quote. The rise of Sendero Luminoso as an insurgent organi organization in Peru has posed a significant puzzle to students of third world revolutions. Sendero seemed to gain strength in the aftermath of a sweeping land reform program whereas analysts have traditionally viewed land reform as a means of preempting revolution by co-opting the base of popular support necessary to sustain a guerrilla insurgency. And so a lot of authors in the Peruvian context have sort of puzzled over the Peruvian case, given that it doesn't seem to fit in, you know, sort of the mainstream received wisdom of the effects of land reform on conflict. <clears throat> That's part of what motiva motivated me to sort of examine this case, because I was interested in, in sort of where the Peruvian case fits, right? <clears throat> the theory that I introduced in this particular paper is that the effect of land reform on conflict should in fact be sort of conditional in, um, on its scale. So at the very low end, areas unaffected by land reform should leave large landowners in place. And that means that these sort of uh, rigid rural um, social hierarchies um, are uninterrupted and they're very effective at undermining, um, stamping out collective action, right? So, so that means that there shouldn't be, um, you know, there should be not, this should not generate um, conflict, right? Where there's no land reform. Partial land reform, on the other hand, might actually exacerbate conflict for several different reasons. One is that it undercuts this hierarchy and that renders um, peasants and rural laborers more subject to um, organization by new political actors that enter into their communities. And the second is that it can generate contestation between winners and losers. It generates grievances, I should say, between winners and losers of a land reform program. Um, and that can generate, uh, generate problems and make it facilitate the ability of guerrilla groups to enter into local communities to sort of, um, you know, mediate between these groups or fight on the behalf of losers against winners, right? Finally, at the high ends, saturating the countryside with land reform, I hypothesize, should actually mitigate conflict. Um, so the lack of non-beneficiaries should sap guerrilla groups of their, of their potential support um, on the part of rural laborers. Furthermore, beneficiaries have incentives to support the new status quo. Um, you know, if you're a land beneficiary, a land reform beneficiary, you join an insurgent group, you might lose everything you just got. Um, and finally, it, it can potentially, land reform can cohere peasant communities by creating shared experiences, um, and whether in terms of production or petitioning the state for inputs and credits and things like that. Um, and it can create new collective opportunities. And then those communities can be used uh, by, to, you know, as partners um, with the state to repel guerrillas from entering into their, into their uh, areas, right? So that's the, that's the sort of, theoretical um, structure that I have in this particular program, Peru, or this particular project, this, uh, you know, the, in the Peruvian case, the land reform, as I'm gonna detail in the next, starting in the next slide here, was really pretty large scale. It was quite large scale. About half of all um, private agricultural land was actually expropriated in the country and redistributed. And so we don't have much of number one here. We don't, we have very few districts where there's no land reform. Districts where there was potential for land reform and there was none at all, right? More typically districts fall in one of these two categories. They either have some degree of land reform or they have something close to land reform saturation. Um, and so what I'm gonna be doing is examining basically the differential effects of land reform saturation over partial land reform. Okay. So to say a few more things and put a little bit more context onto this, um, onto the, the discussion of the theoretical framework. 
So in the case of Peru, um, there was a military coup in 1968, and the military regime that came into power redistributed about half of all private agricultural land in the country over, um, you know, about the docenio, during the docenio, during its 12 years of rule. It started in 1969, the actual land reform program. And most of what happened here is that they created strict landholding ceilings. They also created a prohibition on certain forms of abusive uh, land tenure relations. And if you were engaged in those forms of land tenure relations, then uh, your land was also expropriated. Generally speaking, they, ex they expropriated sort of in broad brushstroke um, two, two, in two different parts of the, um, well, this occurred throughout the country really, but two different sort of broad forms of uh, rural um, estates. One, were, one set was these um, coastal plantations. So in the north of Peru, in the center of Peru, there were enormous coastal plantations that produced sugar, uh, cotton, citrus, et cetera. So those were expropriated. And then the second uh, category were these highlands um, haciendas, right? So these were haciendas up in the mountains. Um, some of them were enormous, enormous in scope. There were some that were 200,000 acres in size, right? Huge haciendas. Not all of them. Some were a lot smaller, obviously. But um, what happened then after the government expropriated these is that they reorganized them. Um, into cooperatives, and then they, um, they assigned peasants into these cooperatives. Typically, people who worked in these cooperatives were people who were laboring on the estate previously, right? They were <laughs> people laboring on the estate. Um, so then at the tail end of this land reform program began the shining path insurgency. It started in 1980, right at the tail end of the land reform program, and raged for about 20 years, between 1980 and 2000. And ultimately, it killed about 70,000 people, which makes it one of the most intense armed conflicts, actually, in Latin, America's, um, in Latin American history. So it's a really important insurgency to, to understand from that perspective. And the transformation it, you know, was an enormous one. It had, it had huge, huge consequences for social relationships, uh, for economic production, uh, for, how, for how people lived and died. Uh, so this is a picture from Asien in the Urubamba Valley in 1961. You can see these are people here who are working on this particular uh, farm. And what happened in, in a lot of Highlands estates, and this is certainly true in the Urubamba Valley, is that people worked, you know, five, six, in some cases, seven days a week for the Asendado. And in exchange, they were given these, um, you know, they were given these sort of little teeny mini fundios, right? These little teeny plots way up on, this, on these hillsides, like at 45 degree slopes, in which they were allowed to produce things for their own families, right? Um, and that changed dramatically. So this is a picture that I took in 2014 of, a, of you know, uh, a similar area in the Utabamba Valley. And you can see this kind of patchwork sort of checkerboard um, pattern of farms, right? So that these Haciendas have, have been broken up, right? And now small people are small, um, small scale farmers now uh, farm, these, farm these plots. So this is, uh, this is sort of uh, something I threw in because I, I remembered this last night. Um, does anybody have any idea? I, I suspect the answer is absolutely not. But does anybody have any idea what this is or where? It was the soccer game that took, took Bacamaro and they, and they uh, put the embassy. You're barking up the right tree. You're barking up the right tree. So soccer game, it's tied, uh, I'll give you a hint, it's tied to Cornell. I'll give you a couple more, we'll see. There's probably, uh, I don't know if anyone's here is old enough to know necessarily, but uh, here's another photo. Nothing, probably nobody from, if we had some anthro people. Does anyone know who this is? Ted Kennedy. Yeah, Ted Kennedy. <laughs> So it turns out that actually Cornell bought uh, one of these haciendas in the, in the Sierras of Peru, in Ancash, Peru, um, sort of on the northern coast, but up in the Sierras. In the, in the 19, uh, I think in the 1950s, they actually purchased it, or the late 1940s. There was a series of researchers, primarily out of anthropology, actually, who started doing work, and they were doing work on, um, on cultural and agricultural change. And so they entered into this community. They ended up at this, this hacienda called Vicos, which is, again, in the state of Ancash in northern Peru. And they started doing a bunch of you know, observation, experimentation, et cetera, right, in the context of this hacienda. Um, I think, I don't know all the history about it. My sense is they started to feel um, 
guilty, perhaps? I'm not sure. But they, start, you know, they, were, they entered into a place in which labor relations were, were brutal, right? These people who worked at the hacienda you know, were in abject poverty. Uh, they, were, they were forced to, to provide you know, physical services, uh, you know, waiting on the, uh, um, you know, on the hacienda's uh, family, things like that. Uh, and they were essentially owned. They were basically serfs, right, um, to this hacienda. In any case, Cornell ended up buying the hacienda in the 1950s. And then I think they sort of, not sure exactly the history, maybe they felt kind of guilty about the fact that they continued to employ these people for a period of time, um, producing agriculturally. And then they sold it to the community, uh, for the people, to the people who were working on it eventually, right? Um, and then later on, actually, the uh, Peace Corps ended up uh, sending uh, volunteers who were going to work in Peru for training at this hacienda before they would then be distributed out to other places in Peru. So anyways, there's kind of an interesting Cornell uh, tie to this stuff, right? Um, Cornell did not, go the, did not go necessarily this route, but Cornell was sort of the intermediary between this and this and one particular hacienda. It's kind of a famous one, though. Uh, it's certainly probably, you can look up, um, I'm sure there's a lot, of, uh, a lot written on it, like in, in Cornell. Stayed with the community, but they continue to do work until recently. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have said they felt guilty or something like that. I mean, they were progressive, right, in the sense that they actually released people from these terrible labor relations. They bought the people with it. So it was, they should have, but it was, uh, yeah, yeah. People were more or less kind of tied to effect, effectively de facto, they were tied to the land. So when they bought the land, they bought the people. What happened during um, the land reform for the Vicos? Had Cornell already sold it before the, to the you know, before the I government? think they did. They I think they sold it in nineteen somewhere between nineteen sixty two and nineteen sixty four. Right yeah, right before. Yeah. So so they so they got ahead of the game. Otherwise, they probably would have been expropriated. Actually, um, so interesting sort of story. Uh, all right. In any case, back to the main, back to the main event. So, um, so that's sort of what, uh, what, what um, you know, that's kind of the context, a little bit about the Peruvian context. So now let me tell you a little bit about my research design strategy for this particular project, which again is trying to link, you know, the land reform and the incidents of land reform with um, civil conflict at the local level in Peru. So what I'm going to do is I take advantage of the fact that the reform was conducted through agrarian reform zones. And I'm going to talk more about this on the next couple of slides. But these agrarian reform zones were created for different reasons, uh, not tied to the land reform in 1960. And furthermore, they didn't map onto major existing administrative boundaries. And so I'm going to exploit that um, using a regression discontinuity design. And I'm going to use districts as the unit of analysis. And so a district's exposure to land reform is going to be determined by whether or not you're in sort of the core department or the core area of an agrarian reform zone, or whether you're in a peripheral area of an agrarian reform zone. Um, and the key point here, the key, the thing that enables me to get identification is that the likelihood of a district receiving land reform shifted discontinuously when you move from outside to inside the border uh, or inside the area of uh, the core area of an agrarian reform zone. Um, and so, you know, the upshot is that the assignment of districts to a zonal core or periphery in areas that's close to this boundary can be viewed as quasi-random. And so this is a map here of Peru's agrarian reform zones as they were created in 1960. So I don't know how many here, by show of hands, are familiar with Peruvian geography at all. OK, good. So you can probably tell that the, the bold black lines do not correspond to Peruvian departments, right? With, uh, with one exception, with the exception of Puno right here. Um, typically, these agrarian, there, there were initially 12, later 13 agrarian reform zones. And they, they typically spanned bits and pieces of multiple departments. OK, they were first, as I mentioned before, conceived in 1960, uh, 1960 by this um, this organization called SIPA. And SIPA was charged with uh, supporting agricultural development and extension through research, experimentation, technical assistance, and promotion. Um, that was actually funded, SIPA was actually initially funded by the United States. This is another sort of interesting background detail. SIPA was created in 1960, but the precursor to SIPA, um, which was again interested in agricultural production, it was funded you know, 50-50 between Peru and the U.S. Actually, it started during World War II because there were concerns about food production, um, sufficient food production. And so 
the United States started um, you know, experimenting with agricultural production in Peru, and it created the precursor to what became SIPA. And what SIPA ended up doing is it took this regional approach to agricultural development in an effort to incentivize uh, production that was diversified zonally in order to maximize uh, producer profits and to maximize output. Um, and so as a result, it, it delimited 12 zones on the basis of ecological conditions, social conditions, transportation routes, and access to, to markets. And so um, you know, they didn't follow department uh, boundaries and in sort of peripheral areas, there wasn't a ton of thought, to, frankly, to exactly how these things were laid out. Um, but by 1967, seven years later, um, agrarian zones became part of national economic planning. And then when the military um, you know, launched a coup and rose to power in 1968, what they did is they grafted the implementation of land reform on top of these agrarian reform zones. Um, and then they expanded it, they expanded it um, you know, nationally, basically the operations nationally. And they did that for several, for several reasons. The first is that this military regime was attempting, and uh, you know, Vincent mentioned this in some of my earlier work, they were attempting to basically crush their rival um, elite uh, you know, providers of, of goods and services, and those were, land, those were landed elites, right? So they wanted to try and destroy landed elites, and they wanted to do so quickly before landed elites could organize to oust them from power. So they wanted to use the structure that they had in place to roll out reform quickly to get rid of these guys. Um, second is that they wanted to, um, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture wanted a relatively small number of agrarian reform zones because they wanted to, uh, you know, reorganize these different expropriate haciendas in ways, in, in sort of in modular ways that enabled them to maximize agricultural output and to minimize the possibility that after expropriation there would be this huge negative shock to production, which might cause backlash to the reform, right? So they wanted to roll this thing out quickly and they wanted to be able to stoke production. And finally, they wanted control, right? This was a very you know, hierarchical military regime. They wanted tight centralized control so they knew exactly what was going on. And so they wanted a few, relatively few zones. So they used this existing structure. Um, what happened then is that when the land reform was routed through the agrarian, agrarian zones, it became operationally rooted in regional land reform offices um, for local implementation of the land reform. Um, and those offices, which you know, were often the administrative core of regional agricultural development, were centered in the highest priority areas for land reform. And um, they, they, those regional offices became core areas. What happened is that they were typically located in the capital of uh, a particular department, right? And then they would interface with the local bureaucracy in that department to implement land reform and to implement land reform quickly. And that gave it this sort of departmental character within agrarian zones. And so what happened is that the creation of these zones, being much larger than departments, led some areas to get a lot more attention from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture for land reform implementation than others, even when you know, there, was similar, there were similarly sort of pervasive haciendas just inside and just outside these core departments where these regional land reform offices were located. And so contemporary, some contemporary accounts suggest this discontinuous shift in land reform treatment probability for districts within a given agrarian zone that were inside versus outside this core um, area where the agrarian zone and regional office were, were centered. Okay. So this is a couple of quotes, and there's some reasons for this, right? So, you know, again, what, you know, what distinguishes sort of a core from a periphery? Well, a core ended up interfacing with, uh, with local bureaucracy more, and they had more tension. Uh, they had more, more resources from the Ministry of Agriculture, as opposed to peripheral areas that were in departments outside the core department within a given agrarian re uh, reform zone. They became sort of forgotten, or they became, they at least leave, received less land reform um, treatment, if you will. There's another reason, which is that in these outlying areas and sort of peripheral areas within agrarian reform zones, landowners were more effective at capture. They, uh, in these peripheral areas, they were more effective at winning allies in, or in some cases, they actually became the land reform officials, right? They served on land reform courts as a way of sort of joining them um, in order to undermine them, right? So, if I can adjudicate my own case, well, maybe, maybe my labor relations aren't so bad after all, right? Um, so they, they, were, they were more effective at capturing 
um, you know, the, the bureaucratic process of land reform in these peripheral areas. So what that leads me, led me to do from the, and it took a, you know, I learned about this over sort of a long period of time as a rather unusual way of implementing a land reform program. Um, but what, what happened is that then I sort of used these core versus peripheral boundaries in, in my identification strategy. So the areas that are white here in Peru are basically um, agrarian zone cores. And the ones that are in black, colored in black, are peripheries. And in red here are the boundaries between core and periphery within each agrarian reform zone. OK, so when you take that down to the district level in Peru, what you have is you have this map of, in bold here, are the different agrarian zones. It's a little hard to see um, back there probably, but there are different departments that are outlined here and sort of dashed lines. And you can see that the areas that are darker, shaded and darker here are again these core zones and the districts that are shaded or that are not shaded, that are white, are peripheral areas within each agrarian uh, zone. Okay, so again, what I'm gonna do here is use, that, use uh, a regression discontinuity design that uses districts as a unit of analysis and the, the distance of a district to the boundary between the core and periphery of an agrarian reform zone um, as the score variable. I'm not going to use a sharp um, RD. I'm going to use a, a fuzzy RD. And that's because the likelihood of a district receiving land reform shifts discontinuously when you go from the core to the periphery. But it doesn't shift um, you know, from... from uh, in that case, it'd be one to zero from the core to a periphery, right? So if you go from the periphery to the core, it's not like if you're in the periphery, you get absolutely no land reform. If you're in the core, you get total land reform saturation. It's simply affected the propensity of the Ministry of Agriculture to show up at your door, knock on it, and say you're expropriated, right? Um, so, and, and it does so in a discontinuous fashion at this border. Okay. So, so that means that I'm using a fuzzy um, regression discontinuity instead of a sharp one. And I have a bunch of different data that took me forever to collect. Uh, the first didn't take long at all because it was already collected. This is conflict data um, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is event level data that covers uh, 24,000 deaths and disappearances. Uh, and it's seen as sort of the most, uh, comprehensive, the most comprehensive data on Peru's civil conflict uh, between 1980 and 2000. What took me a long time to collect was data on the land reform. Uh, and so what I did is I ended up collecting expropriation level data on the land reform for every single property expropriated in Peru between 1969 and 1980. And that covers 12 million hectares of land that were in private use, um, as well as some abandoned and long fallowed private land and lands that were classified as unusable, unusable for, for agriculture um, at the time. So those, some of those were, some of those were state-owned lands, but um, I'm going to focus here on, on private lands for reasons I can talk about more later if people are interested in. But that took a long time. Um, there were about 25,000 or so properties that were expropriated in Peru over this period. My main dependent variable is the number of total conflict events um, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's data. And the score variable here in my regression discontinuity is the distance to the boundary between a, you know, an agrarian reform zone core and periphery. So that's calculated with, uh, with GIS, with mapping software. I'm going to drop a number of agrarian reform zones um, from the analysis for a couple different reasons. So I'm going to drop two of the zones that were located in the jungle of Peru because the land reform legislation did not apply to those two areas, to those two zones. I'm going to drop zones 10 and 13, which are kind of in the in part of the middle of Peru, because that was the one, it was used to be zone 10. It was split between zones 10 and 13 in 1974. So the boundary between the core and periphery changed, and that messes up the, um, you know, you don't get very clean sort of treatment there in these zones. So I'm going to drop these from the analysis. And finally, I'll draw, I drop the one zone that does not have a periphery. So in, for the case of zone 12, the zone comprised the entire state of Puno and nothing else. And so there's no, you know, Puno is the core, there's no periphery. Um, all right, and the treatment take up is the percentage of, di of uh, district area that's expropriated, that's affected by the land reform program. This gives you some sense of uh, what the land, what land reform intensity looked like throughout the country. 
This is the, um, the percentage of land area at the district level that was expropriated, um, logged, so you can see it a little bit easier. You can see it happened, ev it happened everywhere, right? Um, the scale is, is, well, it's logged here, so it's not that easy to interpret, but, um, but you know, even districts that are sort of lightly shaded here receive maybe 15, maybe 15% 15 of the private land area in the, in the district was expropriated. So that's a lot. Uh, when it comes to, to land reform, right? 15% of, you know, of a county, say, of all private land area in a county expropriate. That's actually a lot. Um, okay, so that's sort of spread everywhere. The, the violence was also spread sort of throughout Peru, right? The cradle of the insurgency was in Ayacucho, um, but it spread sort of north and south along the Andean axis, and it even went into the coastal areas as well, right? So um, it was not simply limited to, to where it began. All right, so the key kind of identification assumption here is that for districts that are uh, located just outside of a, of a zonal core area, for those to be appropriate counterfactuals to districts that are just inside an agrarian reform zone core, all relevant factors other than treatment, other than likelihood of getting land reform, have to be similar, right? Um, and so those, those factors have to vary smoothly at the zonal periphery or co core periphery boundary. And so this is the first set of, um, set of results that demonstrates that, in fact, they do. Aside from slope, things like population, road density, uh, state presence, elevation, um, cultivable land, uh, district size, whether or not you're in the, in the Mita Forced Labor Regiment, Colonial Era Forced Labor, labor Regiment, uh, whether or not you're in the Mita Zone, um, as well as things like, um, you know, whether or not you had previous sort of uh, social movements, right? Whether there's a history of organizing, um, typically to oppose, uh, you know, Hacienda, the sort of Hacienda structure, um, and finally private land area. There's no real difference in terms of whether you're just inside or just, whether you're just inside, say, the, the core area of an agrarian reform zone or just outside of it in the periphery, these districts look similar, right? Aside from slope. So in other words, the ones, the peripheral districts are a good comparison set for the core districts. And what I find here, and these are the main, main findings, is that, you know, in fact, in the first stage here, what you find is that if you move from the periphery to the core, of an agrarian reform zone, you're much more likely to get land reform. Um, even though the districts are otherwise similar, you're much more likely to get land reform. You're likely to get about 10, 11% more of your private land area expropriated and redistributed, which again is pretty significant. Um, and then in the second stage for the treatment effect estimates, the effects are negative, which means that more land reform led to less conflict. So this is a, a way of sort of showing that graphically, right? Again, if you move from Outside, just outside of a, of a um, you know, if you're in the periphery and you move towards an agrarian reform zone core, you get to the boundary, and then your likelihood of getting land reform increases again, right? And then if you go from the outside uh, of a core area, you're in the periphery, you move to a core area, and you, there's less conflict intensity. Okay, so that's the basic that's the basic set of findings, right? Is that actually consistent with what a lot of the literature has anticipated, that land reform beds down conflict, but contra what Peruvian scholars have long thought, that in fact the land reform inflamed conflict in Peru, I find that no, actually the effects of land reform were on conflict were negative. Um, I also run through a set of placebo tests here to make sure that the results aren't a function of some weird kind of quirks in the data um, and things like that. And so what I do in this set of columns right here is to artificially manipulate where the boundary between the core and the peripheral area of an agrarian reform zone is, in fact. And what I find is that there are no effects um, except for at the true boundary, right? So this boundary is the right boundary. This boundary is the boundary that actually did impact the likelihood of treatment of, uh, when it comes to land reform, and then it impacted the conflict. There are no effects at these placebo boundaries. I also looked at a different type of, uh, of land reform treatment. So as I mentioned previously, the bulk of this land reform was conducted uh, by expropriating and redistributing privately owned land, right? There was also a small percentage, uh, about 10% of the 12 million hectares of land that were 
redistributed were, um, were state-owned lands, where people didn't live. They were unusable lands, where people typically didn't live. And some of those lands were redistributed, and then they put people on those lands, um, in some cases, afterwards. So there's not the same reason to believe that there might have been um, you know, the same sort of conflict dynamics or contestation over those plots, because there weren't people, there were very different dynamics. People weren't living in those areas previously. And as expected, there's no effects. Um, either in the first or in the second stage uh, um, here for the finding. And finally, what I do is I conduct a placebo test using um, districts that are at periphery, periphery boundaries, boundaries within an agrarian reform zone, right? So there are zones that have these core departments and then they have peripheral departments. There are some zones that span several departments, more than two departments, right? Say three, and in those, in those um, <laughs> In those zones, you have periphery, periphery boundaries at department level board, uh, at department level borders, right? So again, since the core, the difference between the core and the peripheral area is, this, is you know, where the department boundary lies. If you look at departmental boundaries in periphery versus periphery areas, what you see is that in fact, again, there's no result. So that gives you more confidence that in fact you're uncovering something about the nature of this land reform design uh, or the, the design of the land reform program itself, and then subsequently how land reform treatment impacted um, conflict, right? Okay, so you made it, congratulations, you made it past the, the, it's a rather complicated and nuanced sort of strange nature of a design of a land reform program, but it's really useful empirically to try and figure out, you know, why, how land reform actually impacts uh, conflict, right? In sort of a, a way that gets a little bit cleaner identification. All right, so then the question is how, right? How? So if land reform beds down conflict to a degree, how does it do so? So there's a number of different mechanisms that are offered in the, in the literature. One is that you know, it can, land reform can deflate peasant support for guerrillas by improving their economic and social conditions um, and reducing grievances over inequality. So that's one potential mechanism. A second, which I mentioned previously, economic opportunity, right? If you grant people access to land and they become somewhat wealthier, they're more reticent to join a, a guerrilla group and risk what they've got. The third might be rural organization. So through the context of land reform, and certainly this is true in the Peruvian case because people were put into cooperatives, they worked together, right? They acted collectively to produce at the very minimum and they could potentially act collectively for other reasons as well that might be useful later for repelling violence in their community. Um, and finally, cooperative structures. So there's a hypothesis that um, you know, cooperative structures in Peru lacked accountability to their members. Um, but on the other hand, they could also be used perhaps as a launching pad for the state for counterinsurgent operations, right? So again, this is a this is a bit of a these are diff four different mechanisms that are out there in the literature. Some of them are drawn. They're all sort of several. These first three, I say, I'd say, are a little bit general. The fourth one is a little more Peru specific. Again, most of the Peruvian scholars have suggested that the relationship would be opposite to that. What I've to, to what I've found, right? Um, and so their, their hypotheses are typically the opposite of these uh, up here, right? Although I should say, you know, one other reason why I think this is an interesting and important study is that a lot of people who are doing, you know, who hypothesized that the land reform actually backfired and generated more conflict had to, had to leave the field uh, during the conflict, during the course of the conflict, right? So there were a lot of people doing really good important, uh, a lot of anthropologists, historians, in particular, some political scientists as well, who were doing work in Peru in the 1960s. Most of them ended up leaving in the 1970s. And so they sort of hypothesized that it had this, had this backfire effect on the basis of the, what they knew about those communities, but they, um, they, a lot of times, were not in those communities during the conflict, right? Um, furthermore, Peru, for those of you who have been to Peru, there's a really punishing geography to Peru, right? It's not, you can't just travel up and down this, all the Sierra, right, and, you know, um, figure out what's the general effect of this sort of program. I mean, you know, people have done very good research in a small number of communities, but it's not always clear whether that's generalizable. And what I've found here is that, at least for the, con for the relationship between land reform and conflict, it, it wasn't generalizable. All right, so what's the punchline for, for mechanisms in terms of what I found? Well, so I looked at a bunch of other um, data and you know, data tied to, I disaggregated the conflict data 
into um, events that were perpetrated by the state versus guerrillas versus paramilitaries um, versus basically auto defensas. Um, I also looked at data on deaths as opposed to simply events, right? Events by armed actors. I looked at data on, um, on elevation, right? To look at heterogeneous sort of treatment effects along the lines of how far you were more or less kind of from the coast, right? Um, up the Andes. I looked at, um, I looked at data on, on, well, data on cooperatives aren't very good, unfortunately, but I looked at data on, on producer organizations and on participation and what, are, what were known during the conflict is rondas campesinas, which are basically, um, basically out the defensas. They were basically you know, communities that organized themselves to repel guerrilla actors, but also to do a bunch of other things, um, you know, get rid of cattle hustlers and stuff like that as well. So I looked at a bunch of data on this, and what I found through an analysis of all that was that it seems like the, effect of, uh, the negative effect of land reform on conflict runs through, one, ameliorating peasant grievances, and two, building local organizational capacity that was used to deter violence, right? So that, those two seem to have much more support than the possibility that cooperative structures somehow led to the, to the effect, which would not be particularly generalizable, and economic opportunity, right? Um, the negative effects of land reform on conflict were actually higher in the highlands than they were in the coast. Again, somewhat contrary to what Peru scholars have sort of thought. Um, so that leads us to, you know, a, a, a set of uh, you know, conclusions here, which I suppose in the interest of time I'll, I'll leave out, but it's basically what I just said on the last slide, right? Um, it seems like in the Highlands, land reform, you know, while it didn't go as far as it perhaps could have, could have in fact expropriated more land, uh, it seems like it went far enough actually for the purposes of reducing grievances and bedding down um, conflict with that occurred in the subsequent uh, civil conflict. Okay, so there's, a proviso and a set of implications here, and then I'm done. So this is the last slide. So the first is that you know this project looks at essentially kind of like the marginal effect of more land reform on conflict, right? It doesn't tell you why Peru's civil war began. Um, I can't tell you that. Uh, I can't tell you that from from my data, right? Um, you know, there are a whole host of there's a whole host of important work on that, and I think that that speak to that particular question better than I do. I'm more interested in the in the, in the marginal effect of more land reform on conflict. So I don't do that. Um, and the second is an implication, right? So, and this is sort of a plug for you know all of you grad students out there who are interested in doing, you know, interested in thinking about dissertations, interesting, interested in doing, um, you know, building data sets, things like that. There's a lot of data out there on these kinds of programs. I mean, I have gathered local level data on land reform for at, at least a dozen countries, maybe 15 countries, not all in Latin America. I mean, there's, I have data um, on, on Portugal's land reform in the mid-1970s, right? Um, I have data on Italy. I just got, recently gathered data on Italy's post-World War II land reform. There are a lot of um, you know, expropriation level data in both cases. So there are a lot of data that are sitting out there. And you know, I think because land reforms occurred sort of prior to the rise, to a large degree, not exclusively, but to a large degree prior to the rise of modern computing, people haven't really collected these data sets and looked at the implications or the effects of land reform on a whole host of different um, economic and social sort of development outcomes, right? Um, but there are reasons to believe, given the, the scale of these programs, that they had huge impacts on not only on conflict, but on a whole bunch of other things, right? Um, and I should say, you know, a lot of countries are still doing land reform. So if it sounds boring to do historical work, South Africa has a very large land reform. Brazil has a large land reform that's ongoing. Um, the Philippines, Colombia, these are all countries that are doing land reform right now uh, and that are, in fact, gathering pretty good data on it as well. So, you know, it's important to look at this stuff. And if you gather data on that, you can perhaps start to understand a little bit better conflict in rural areas, not only in Latin America, but in some of these other places, right? I mean, Afghanistan had a big land reform program. Syria had a big land reform program. In fact, I know someone now who's looking at the effects of the land reform, earlier land reform on patterns of violence in Syria. So that's just a plug and implication. So, all right, thanks very much.